For more on the equity market, let's welcome in uh, Lucas Tamiki, founder and managing partner at LRT Capital Management. Lucas, thanks so much for being here. Thanks for having me. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. So I know you have some out of the box kind of investment ideas, but before we get to those, I want to talk about some more obvious, I guess, investment ideas or lack thereof, uh, because I was taking a look at your notes and you're actually bearish on NVIDIA, one of the, the top performing stocks today and of course all year. Is this a valuation call? What's behind your bearishness on NVIDIA? So we've written a piece several months ago when we talked about AI being full of false promises and frauds and hype in general. So the issue that we see with NVIDIA is that people are latching on to anything AI and extrapolating that into the future without really having much technical knowledge about how large language models work and how AI tends to work. I co-founded and sold two software businesses. I actually write code and I know how these models work. So I feel I have some credibility to speak about how these models are improving or not improving. And while NVIDIA has run up a lot and is selling a lot of chips, people are extrapolating their sales into the future in a big way that I think is not going to be realized because I think the promise of AI is not going to deliver the productivity gains that people are expecting. And as a result, the CapEx is going to come down and NVIDIA sales with it. Okay, so this isn't a case of there's going to be more competition in the market. It's just that you think that the, the whole NVIDIA craze will kind of fizzle out. I think the demand is going to slow. Now, it's still going to grow. We, we, every year we have more computers, more data. But NVIDIA is already pricing in a growth in demand into the indefinite future. And historically, it's been a fairly cyclical business. So if you value it where it is, if you want to buy it today, you have to believe that it's become a secular grower like, say, health insurance, as opposed to a more cyclical company, which it has been traditionally. OK, so are there any AI plays that you would favor instead or because, I mean, NVIDIA is certainly isn't the only name that's had a lot of hype because of AI. Yeah, we're not directly investing in AI in any big way. We do own TSMC, Taiwan Semiconductor, and we do like that as a manufacturing pick and shovels type play because ultimately their manufacturing capacity can be shifted away from making NVIDIA GPUs to making other types of semiconductors. And they remain on the cutting edge uh, within the manufacturing space. So we like TSMC. And that's probably the most direct exposure we have to semiconductors. But we also own a company called Comfort Systems, which does commercial HVAC contracting. So they're a subcontractor. And they're not directly related to AI, but they have been benefiting in recent quarters from a growth in the, the, the investments that we have in the United States for manufacturing capabilities. And part of that, of course, is more data centers. So they, they're an adjacent beneficiary, uh, and that's how we like to play it. Okay, and then in, outside of the AI space, I know you're looking uh, for foreign economic growth and to, ways to play that you're investing in foreign airport operators. Explain this thesis to us. Certainly. So airlines traditionally have been a terrible place to invest. And Warren Buffett famously says that every time he thinks about investing in an airline, he has an 1-800 number he calls and they talk him out of it. And I totally agree with the Oracle of Omaha on this. Airlines are a terrible place to invest. But actually, the airports are, by, by, by contrast, a great place to invest. Because while you can change which airline you're going to fly any day based on whoever gives you the best price, if you're trying to fly into Cancun, you're only going to fly into Cancun airport. You're not going to fly in, into somewhere else. And there are several airport traded operators of airports that are publicly traded. They're all outside the US and they own these key assets, which are essentially irreplaceable. And every year, a little bit more people travel. And the thing about travel is that it tends to be a luxury good, meaning people spend more of it as a percentage of income as their income grows. So every year, travel grows about one and a half times the rate of GDP growth. And the names we have in our portfolio specifically have exposure to Mexico, 
to Cancun, to Monterrey, which is clearly emerging as a manufacturing hub of Mexico, as well as the airport operations in Argentina. So if you're looking abroad for economic growth, what does that say about your outlook for the U.S.? So we like the U.S. as a place to do business. And I, I've been living in the United States for over 20 years. I'm originally from Poland, uh, but I love the U.S. and we're very happy here. I think the U.S. is a very resilient economy that has deep economic and political reservoirs of stability. So despite whatever you might think about U.S. politics, whoever wins the election, there'll be some hand wringing and it will just move on. Those are incredible strengths of the U.S. And I feel I think there's tremendous long term growth opportunities in the United States. Having said that, the, the one thing that worries me with respect to the United States is the budget deficit that we have. And we have an incredibly large budget deficit and neither political party is talking about or has any commitment to bringing that down. And right now we have a very strong economy, and I think largely one of the reasons we have a very strong economy because we're pushing basically two trillion dollars of deficit spending into the economy we've never had this level of deficit spending during peacetime and so one of the problems is that as the fed is going to be cutting rates into the next foreseeable few quarters the pace of those cuts really matters with respect to the impact they're going to have on the u.s budget because Several quarters ago, our Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen changed the composition of the debt issuance in such a way that they're traditionally used to issue an equal split, more or less, between long-term, short-term, and medium-term securities. They changed that to be about 80% in short-term Treasury bills. And that lowered the interest rate for a while, but that means that there's a huge amount of debt that's coming due that's going to have to be rolled over. And interest payments on U.S. debt are already exceeding $1.2 trillion this year. And they're on track to hit $2 trillion within the next two years. Now, so what matters, of course, is if interest rates come down dramatically, like some people believe they will, then that interest bill will be much lower. But if they don't come down that quickly because the economy stays strong, then we might be heading to a world of $2 trillion plus in interest payments and a budget deficit that's completely out of control. And I think at some point it will have to be corrected and that will be a big shock to the economy, either through lower spending or higher taxes and probably a combination of both. Well, the latest economic data certainly doesn't point to uh, rate cuts uh, coming more quickly than expected. So that being said, are you putting money to work here in the U.S. or are you just waiting and seeing until uh, you start to get some answers on that front? No, we are investing in the U.S. As I said, I think the U.S., despite its problems, is what I like to call the cleanest dirty shirt. So while the U.S. has problems, other places also have problems. And I think what's, what's also important to distinguish is that the U.S. corporate sector is probably in the best shape it's ever been in its history in terms of relatively low debt levels, global dominance of, of several U.S. companies uh, in a way that was not that dominant in the past, say 20 years ago, and profit margins that are, are essentially at all time highs. So corporate America is, is in a very good place and it's quite well managed. And again, we may complain about corporate governance here and there, but compared to many other places in the world, the governance, the performance of our companies is fantastic. So we continue to invest in the U.S., but selectively, we are looking to invest abroad where we think the valuations make sense and the business models are very resilient. All right. Well, we appreciate your picks. Lucas Tomicki, founder and managing partner of LRT Capital Management. Thank you so much. Thank you.